thanks everyone for uh, taking time out of their uh, stranded schedules at home and not going anywhere to uh, actually watch my presentation. So as Sam mentioned, a look at IoT device interchip communication. Uh, what this presentation is about, it's kind of a focus on uh, looking at uh, communication as it flows between chips on a circuit board uh, and some very specific stuff that we started out as this project uh, that we're going to actually talk about today. Again, my name is Daryl Highland, Research Lead uh, at I, uh, for IoT at Rapid7. Been doing this crazy stuff for 25 plus years. So why am I doing this research? Why are we going down this? Uh, what's the whole purpose of this thing? Uh, the big thing is, is I wanted to really start getting an understanding of what end to end is when we're looking at IoT technology, you know, because we can look at all of the components, all the data, the cloud services, the communication, but what happens when data hits that circuit board? Uh, is there stuff that we can glean from that? Can we learn from that? Can we figure, uh, you know, the functionality, security, a better idea of what that ecosystem is? Uh, and the why is to identify attack vectors uh, eventually. Uh, this presentation, we're not going to talk about any specific attack vectors uh, that have been uh, found or identified, uh, but we're going to talk about the, the concepts around some of those. Uh, improve product testing methods. Uh, by thinking about uh, IoT uh, interchip communication uh, analysis, can we add more steps, more capability into our toolbox uh, around testing product technology? Can we use this to potentially uh, identify vulnerabilities? Uh, and also, can we use what I'm showing today, the concepts today, to potentially weaponize a product to use it to attack other things? So the target focus on this research initially, uh, like I said, was interchip communication. But the main part starting off is looking at Bluetooth low energy devices and non-routable protocols. So as an example, if you have a piece of IoT technology that's running Bluetooth low energy, and you want to control it from the internet, you have to bridge that technology to the internet. So you start looking at bridging technology. Now, bridging technology will tie the ethernet side, Wi-Fi side in to the Bluetooth side to give you that uh, full ecosystem uh, and control from the cloud. So in that case, we wanna be able to look at the communication as it's flowing across that circuit board to get a better understanding of the uh, threat vectors, because if we have a piece of technology that has fairly good security, let's say they're doing the Bluetooth uh, low energy right, uh, they're encrypting the communication out of the back end of the device to the cloud. So at that point, we really can't see a whole lot or get insight into it. But if we start looking at the data that's flowing between processors on the actual bridging technology. At this point, we're potentially looking at technology or data that isn't encrypted in any way. It is the raw data to tell this device to do A, B, or C, or whatever it was designed to do. So the goal of the presentation is in this research is to dig into that and look at methods, methodologies, and such. So, uh, one of the things I mentioned is looking at the interchip communication. Now, there's two uh, general scenarios we see when we look at these bridging technologies. Uh, well, there's literally three, but there's two that we use for testing. The one we wouldn't use for testing, it would be the uh, primary processor, the microcontroller unit would be both BLE, Wi-Fi, and Ethernet. Uh, so it's kind of hard to see interchip uh, data communication when there's no other chips other than the primary CPU. But in the two that I often counter uh, the majority of the time fall in these two categories here. It has a BLE, a Bluetooth low energy microcontroller, and a Wi-Fi microcontroller or an Ethernet some type of network microcontroller. The other one has uh, multiple microcontrollers and it would be like a BLE, it would have a main microcontroller and then it would have a, the network circuitry or network MCU associated with that or it could contain other uh, microcontrollers that are all overall managed by the main microcontroller unit on the device there. In that case there, these are uh, the communication paths we wanna be able to tap into uh, to see what's going on. So getting started uh, to be able to tap into this and start looking at it, you have to be able to find the circuits uh, on the board. So how do we go about doing that? 
so the first thing is reverse engineering the circuit board. Literally, let's map out the circuit board. That would include pulling down data sheets. Uh, it may involve using a multimeter to ring out uh, connections from point A to point B. Uh, a lot of visual. Uh, the background on this screenshot is actually a circuit board that we literally uh, took all the components off of it, stripped it bare as an example as a test unit to actually map out the entire circuit board and kind of reverse engineer it to get a better layout of what was going on. Also, uh, Damien Coquill, um did a presentation hacking in Paris. And one of the things he, he, he did in that presentation was dealing with photo overlay. So taking photo overlays of both sides of the board and making them translucent and laying them over each other to kind of map out both sides of the circuit board into a, a, a visual uh, with the vias passing through. Uh, another option would be x-ray. If you want to go to the extreme level and you have access to x-ray and you're dealing with multi-layer boards where it may be critical to be able to look at all the different layers that are actually in the board. So again, you want to be able to re reverse engineer the circuit board, understand what's on the board, how they're all interconnected, and that's the only way you'll eventually be able to tap into the right circuit and be able to analyze the communications. So the first device we want to uh, look at uh, happened to be a, a smart lock called a Hickory. Hickory Smart is put out by uh, Hickory. Um, so let's go and dig into that. So this is its general layout. It has a uh, BLE microcontroller. It had a main microcontroller, and then it had a separate Ethernet circuitry involved in this. And our goal is to look at BLE to uh, main MCU and look at that communication. When dealing with BLE, it's a simple form of communication. It's UART, a universal asynchronous receive and transmit. Uh, I have not run across uh, a BLE uh, chip that uses anything but that for uh, receiving communications from a, another processor uh, and for receiving command structures from other processors. So uh, on this particular device, this is kind of a open the device up, start taking a look at it. It had a, a, a SRU-532, which uh, I kind of remember the name of the company, uh, started with a D, Dynamic or something like that uh, was the name of the, the company. And under the hood on this particular um, Bluetooth low energy module was just an NRF-51422. The main processor on this was an LPC-1778, which is an ARM Cortex M3. This particular board's layout was way more simpler than a number of that we run into. So as we dug into the board and start looking at it, we pulled the data sheets down, figure out how each one of these components, the Bluetooth low energy module was laid out and pinned out. Uh, we also looked at how the... Um, ARM Cortex processor was actually pinned out and what pins were used for what in this particular case. Uh, I think with the uh, ARM Cortex, this one was a general GPIO, so it wasn't tagged as typical transmit receive, if I remember correctly, or it was potentially multiple. Um, so we had to trace it back from the actual Bluetooth low energy device. And this is kind of here us tracing this out. As we can see, the green runs runs all the way to from pin 69 on the primary microcontroller to actually pin 6 um, on the module. Um, the yellow line, which is receive over to the transmit line, which is on the other side of the uh, one device actually passes through the board as a via and we can see with a larger yellow line there. So at this point we want to be able to in this project be able to do a number of different things. We want to be able to capture the data and look at it. Uh, we want to be able to sever the communication between these two devices so they can't see each other as part of some of the testing. We also want to be able to inject data into the UART circuit. And this is an end-to-end -end circuit with no components in between it. Uh, to be able to uh, inject in data into this with uh, some kind of UART tool, the line has to be severed. Uh, if you try to inject into these connected lines, uh, it won't it won't work. Uh, if you run into a circuit that actually has like resistors in line with it uh, as kind of a terminating or impedance matching type circuitry, often you can eject data into those without cutting the lines. But the ultimate goal uh, is to be able to tap into this, cut the 
cut the runs and route all the communication off the board onto a breakout board for further analysis and testing. So here we can see where we've attached the red leads or red arrows actually show uh, the connections for transmit to receive, receive to transmit between the two components. The green marks are marks on the circuit board where I actually took a razor knife and cut the circuit board runs. So at this point, everything has to leave the board. Uh, and I built these small breakout boards. I have probably three or four of these that I've built. It gives me the ability to uh, use the screw terminals to land the wires and we also have headers so we can hook multiple pieces of test equipment, whether you want to hook an O-scope up, uh, a logic analyzer, uh, or some other kind of tools, uh, serial communication tools to this. And we have a on and off dip switch, gives us the ability to literally turn the circuit on and off as needed if we want to capture and replay data onto the circuit or actually inject our own fuzzing data into the circuit. So when it's all said, this is kind of how it's rigged up. This is probably one of the first ones that I did. Um, we have uh, over to the left, uh, those are two shikras where we're using the UART communications on those to tap in. And of course, uh, Sele logic analyzer to initially kind of map out the communication and figure out its bald rate, um, how long each, how many bytes are in each standard packet to kind of identify that whole structure and format there. So this is how it was all laid out. Right now, I actually have, instead of using the Shikras, I have a, a four-way serial device uh, that I hook everything up to. But I continue to use these breakout boards like I have showed here. These things are uh, very useful, uh, and they come in really handy. I have one sitting in the desk right beside me uh, and one over on my workbench right now with stuff hooked up on it that I'm actually working on. So let's keep going with this. Uh, so let's look at the communication on this particular device, get an idea of looking at this, what are we seeing, how do we potentially decode it. Uh, again, this is kind of the layout. We have a lock device, uh, which is believed to be Bluetooth low energy. <laughs> you'll, you'll see something interesting here in a minute. We have a bridge device, which is where we want to tap into the inner chip communication, and then a cloud-based services. And this, uh, and I can't overemphasize, if we're in the center of this, that gives us a lot of capabilities. We could potentially, uh, in testing, be able to inject data from the bridge device to the lock device, or potentially send data back out to the cloud from this test point also. So we went ahead and we hooked up to the circuit we had showed in that one picture and we captured the data. We captured uh, opening the lock and closing the lock. And from there we can make some general analysis here. Uh, we see that the, the beginning of the communication starts out with a 2D, uh, 2376 BD. I mean there's so much that is identical up until you get about a third of the way through and hit a 3.9 or 3E. So at this point, you know, how do we identify this uh, and what these components uh, are? Also, uh, the, it's also important, this is where a logic analyzer comes in. If you're just capturing UART, uh, when you're capturing um, processor to processor communication, there's no end of line characters or uh, carriage returns. So it's just gonna continue streaming data. Uh, so using a logic analyzer, you can figure out where the packets start, where they begin, and identify the potential uh, beginning and ending terminators of the communication data that's going through. So this is what it all decoded into. Uh, the 2D, uh, 2D23, was basically a frame header. We go clear to the end. We had a 8-bit uh, checksum to complement. And in between, we had some various other pieces of information. Some we were able to identify, some we weren't. Uh, to start with, the uh, device ant SN. Often when we're looking at communication going from a main processor to a BLE chip, uh, in this type of environment, we'll most often see the MAC address in that communication. In this communication, there was no MAC address. Uh, it turned out by looking at other stuff on the chip, uh, actually pulling firmware on the chip and taking a look to try to see what they were doing, uh, it was determined they were using a protocol called ANT. Um, uh, this kind of took me back. I wasn't expecting it. This particular um, 
NRF processor <clears throat> is capable of Bluetooth low energy and ant communication. Um, if you were communicating to this device with a mobile phone directly to the lock, it was using BLE. The bridge was the only one using ant protocol. So it's very BLE-like, but ant protocol you often see used in fitness bands and heart rate monitors for sharing this data. Um, this particular type of protocol has a number of different security mechanisms that are interesting. It allows multiple pairing. Unlike BLE, multiple devices can actually be authenticated to the device at the same time which is very interesting. It also has multiple pairing cap functions or features, and I have them listed here. Everything from exclusion, exclusion, white blacklist, proximity search, wildcard. So there's six different type of pairing structures that can be created, some of them with low security, some of them with high security. Uh, I don't remember which one off the top of my head that they were using here, but it was obviously the more higher security uh, pairing process. So now we go back and we look at the uh, communication on this thing, uh, and we also find out it has AMP protocol. We also analyzed, and we'll show this in a minute how we did this, that the bridge device to the cloud was using MQTT as part of its communication. This was determined by looking at that main processor actually had a UART console. So we hooked onto the UART console, and we were able to see it carry out the MQTT uh, communications. When we're also looking at that console, it turned out that all the data coming from the cloud into the cloud was encrypted. MQTT, MQTT uh, was all encrypted, but the console debug console on the microprocessor dumped the full decode of the packet out there. And from this data here, it helped us further analyze that communication to the BLE chip and identify what it was. We're able to identify op type, it shows op type here, and that is one and two. Uh, one is open and two is a close, I believe. Uh, we also see the device ant serial number. This is like a MAC address, but this is what's used by ant communication protocol. We also had a key down here that happened to be base 64. And right above that, there's uh, uh, op prams which is a base 64 encoded block. If we decode that, all it spells out is operation parameters. So it's a holding spot that isn't currently being used. So we wanted to be able to check to see if this key was the actual key that was being transmitted from the main processor to the BLE device. So we took the base 64 using a standard echo command, base 64 hex dump, and we compared it to the communication uh, going out to the actual uh, BLE chip from the main processors, and we can see it's the same. Now, uh, obviously, the, the two bytes are a reverse order, so C2, 2C is 2C, C2 uh, in the output there, but it is the exact same uh, key that's actually being used. So that's how we're able to identify the key. So we have the frame header, the device ants uh, serial number, which, which is like a MAC address, op type, which tells it to open and close. We weren't able to identify the first unknown, um, the 03 or the 05, uh, but we also identified that there is a four byte op time, which is like the standard Linux timestamp. Uh, and then we had the key and then the actual checksum. So we're able to take this uh, and start experimenting with it at that time. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, initially, we just tried to replay this. What happens if we replay this at the chip level? And we turned out that this key never expires. Uh, it always works. Uh, I've come in four months later and replayed something I captured four months ago, and it works. So what does this tell us when we start looking at these devices? One, this one was interesting because it had AMP protocol. It took me off, uh, took me off my edge. Wasn't expecting that. Uh, the keys never expire. So also, uh, since the keys never spire and every packet coming in from the cloud or every request coming in from the cloud has a different key, what is this key made of? What is used to construct this key? And how does the Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth or BLE device know if the key is correct or not? Remember, the, these devices are unaware of each other, unroutable protocol, and we're using the bridge 
uh, to route the communication. So there has to be what's known as a shared secret. So the shared secret in this particular case happens to be when the device, the Bluetooth lock device, is actually configured. It has a little barcode on it. You enter that data. That's communicated up to the cloud. And now they have a shared secret. Since it's rotating constantly, how does it calculate that and how does it change? Because it would have to have another thing to actually identify that. And we believe it actually is the timestamp. We believe the timestamp is some type of salt to the encryption, which is constantly changing a uh, known shared secret. So it gives us some insight on how this device is communicating, how its end-to-end -end security is working. And of course, moving forward, it opens up more opportunities. So how can we do fuzzing attacks against this? How can we do other testing to this thing? Uh, can we trick the device? Can we figure out what the shared secret is external to the device. How well is that actually protected in all the communication? Because if we have the shared secret, we can potentially get the timestamp and potentially be able to identify a key or generate our own key that would actually work as an attack vector. <clears throat> so the second device we looked at here, um, actually is a, a, a Brelong. I don't have it marked here, but it's a Brelong, but uh, we're not discussing any known vulnerabilities with it, just how the device is functioning in the same kind of concepts. In this particular case, there is no main CPU. It is a Wi-Fi MCU and a BLE MCU. So this is how the device is actually laid out and configured uh, in this particular environment. So uh, in this case here, we have the, uh, the Wi-Fi actually is an expressive, uh, which we already know expressives have a number of their own issues. Uh, and then we have the BLE module up here, uh, which is uh, specifically uh, built by this manufacturer. And we blow this up and we start looking at where the transmit receives are. We can see in this particular circuit, there is actually a small resistor in line in the communication path. And I know I had mentioned this earlier. So at this point, we want to do the same thing. We want to be able to tap into the circuit, route all the communication off to a breakout board so we can better do our analysis and testing in this particular device. So if we look at how we're going to tap into this, we find out that to tap into a circuit like this, you need to be on the transmit side of that resistor. Uh, if you're on the other side of that resistor, I've noticed it caused some kind of impedance loading issues that were kind of weird between the two devices, uh, and it impeded the communication or halted the communication in a number of times. But if we did it on the transmit side, we were fine. So if we're going to tap two wires in and cut the runs and do it on the transmit side, we're a little bit in trouble here because uh, that's probably only, you know, three or four, five millimeters uh, of space to be able to do all that and isn't really practical. So as we gave this some thought on how to do this, it was like, well, why don't we just move that resistor to somewhere else on the board? It'll still accomplish the same thing. So that's what we did. We kind of flipped the board over. Uh, and we can see that all that communication coming off the BLE was actually routed through two vias and over to the Wi-Fi card uh, in this particular case. So what we did was we removed that resistor and we switched over to the other side. We ended up cutting the run, soldering it up, and actually soldering the resistor onto that side. And then we were able to just connect our two wires to the other side of the board where the resistor once was to break that circuit and then cut the other run right below it uh, and be able to tap into that down down that side to be able to give us the, the level of connectivity um, and routing the communication off to our test and board test board uh, as you can see my breakout board is designed a little different I've been trying a number of different designs to see which one are easier to work with uh, but here we are we went ahead and tapped into this device there's probably a few extra wires hooked onto that board because I was doing some other weird stuff with it too uh, we brought it over to this to be able to do our breakout with uh, and analyze the communication 
So let's go ahead and look at the interchip communication uh, on uh, device number two. So we went ahead, similar to the other one, we went ahead and captured uh, basically an open and a close. Uh, we also captured, uh, showing in this picture, the actual return data. So we have uh, BLE receive data and BLE transmit data that went over to the Wi-Fi chip. Uh, the transmit data went over the Wi-Fi chip was in two blocks of data. The one was saying, hey, I did the command. The second one was generally telling it the status after the command was executed. So if we look at the, above that, the BLE receive, the open and the close, we can literally see that this packet, other than the second byte and the last byte, never changes ever uh, in this particular case. We started analyzing this and we also found out that the actual MAC address wasn't in the transmit packet. This kind of confused us. There, uh, there's an eight byte block of data there turned out to be actually encoded. So they took six bytes and encoded it into eight bytes, which I have no idea why. So how do we figure out that that was the actual block that they were encoding? I did this through some general fuzzing. Uh, because what happens is the return data coming back from the BLE microcontroller to the Wi-Fi microcontroller actually contains the MAC address, which is extremely strange. You would encode it one way and not the other way. Uh, I'm not sure of the mindset there, uh, but this is generally what it looked like. So we sent an open command. We got the two commands back, and we're able to receive this MAC address. We started fuzzing each one of the bytes up there being injected into it, and we found out that if we alter any of those eight bytes, we actually were able to change the MAC address. And we noticed that any of the bytes had to be changed by uh, two bits or, or, or uh, two characters. Uh, if we didn't, it would actually uh, not return anything. So if we look at this, what I did was I went through, this is just a small sample, where we went through altering these in a fuzzing attempt and building a table. Um, I didn't have the time, so I reached out to a number of the coworkers at Rapid7 and go, hey, here's a fascinating puzzle. If anyone's interested in digging into this puzzle uh, to see what it looks like. Uh, and Pierce was able to jump in there and uh, he took this data, converted it into binary and started mapping it all out uh, and was able to figure out generally what they were doing here uh, to the point where he was able to create a coding decoding tool, making it possible for me to, uh, if I wanted to, a, Mac, a MAC address encoded into this particular encoding mechanism, I could do it. And then I could use that for various fuzzing. I don't show it any details here, but the other one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bytes that come after that, we weren't able to figure out what those were completely. We believe those were some kind of key, but we started fuzzing these. Uh, and we found out the last two bytes, the 9.8, the D6, that we we're able to fuzz those um, to a point and not prevent the lock from actually rotating, which was very interesting, means that the potential key space is uh, much smaller that they used to generate this key with. Uh, at this point, we ain't figured out what that is, uh, but it's on the radar screen to uh, circle back around on these and continue doing some kind of uh, testing, uh, injections, and fuzzing. So we also, in this particular case, went a little bit further. Um, this particular bridge uh, device will only pair with one lock. So if you have two locks, then you have to have two bridges, which is strange. But we wanted to figure out how the bridge devices were programmed. So we captured them during the setup and configuration. So the first one is to remove the bridge from the lock setup. And it run these three packets, hit it, which basically removed it from the system. Uh, what it actually did was, if we look at the bytes starting with the, uh, we have 
four bytes over goes BC, CC, C2, A01C. If we take that eight bytes there, like the we're on the other screen, uh, that is the encoding, and we run this through a decoder, it's basically setting all of the uh, MAC address to all zeros, uh, is what this actually did. Uh, and then we walk through and we added the bridge back in um, the legitimate bridge with the uh, legitimate MAC address or adding the device back into the bridge. Uh, all these packets were the same other than the second byte, which kind of defines some kind of command structure. And uh, the last eight bytes on the last one. And by replaying this data, uh, we did a couple tests. One, I tried removing the lock and adding another lock using this mechanism, and that worked. I was able to add another lock to the device, remove the old one, add another lock just by injecting my data at the chip level. Then we went back and I said, well, what happens if I don't remove the bridge, uh, the lock, and I just add a new lock? And I did that, uh, and we had some really strange occurrences because for about 30 minutes after injecting this into the actual BLE chip, I was able to uh, control two separate locks from the same bridge by interjecting uh, at the chip level. Uh, what does that mean? I'm not sure, but it opened up a number of uh, potential further testing and attack points that we're going to need to uh, look at kind of moving forward. So observations uh, of end-to-end -end security. In this particular case, it was BLE pairing. Uh, the MAC address was encoded, which is kind of strange. It was encoded in one direction, not the other. This particular one had the same key. It was the exact same key over and over and over. So just want to point that out. So if we look here again, we see the only difference in the open and close shown on this page here is the zero, 00 versus the zero, 01. So literally the exact same key. So there, there isn't anything about, hey, test this six months down the road, see if it expires. It's never going to expire. It's never going to change. It's always going to be the same key. Uh, so that opens up uh, interesting ideas about the potential uh, security uh, related to this device. Encoding from a, a common shared secret. Um, like the other one, which had uh, what appeared to be a, a shared secret and also the timestamp potentially used to generate it, this one did not have that. So there's some kind of encoding taking place against some shared secret which again, I believe it is the initial setup code for the BLE device. Uh, when you register it in the cloud, that would be the shared secret. So then it starts us thinking, how safe is that shared secret? Uh, is there other ways to pull it off the device? Are there other TAC methods? The communication to the cloud, the cloud services, does it secure that shared secret or the device identifier that's used to generate that shared secret uh, effectively. And these are things that uh, actually need to be uh, considered uh, going forward. So um, last thing we want to do is we want to kind of finish up here with some of the testing processes, implementing methods to my madness, and give these some, some thoughts. So one of the things we want to do um, and what we showed today is, is kind of the process of tapping into the interchip communication for analysis. It's the process of mapping out the boards, the process of tapping into the boards, uh, rerouting traffic off the boards. Uh, we want to be able to move forward by doing this and build testing methodologies around replay. Can we carry out uh, testing functionality and do replays? Can we map out communication paths and functions effectively? Can we validate true end-to-end -end security? I mean, as we look at what we've done with this so far, uh, at the limited level we have so far, we've identified basically how the keying mechanisms work. Uh, we haven't solved the encoding or encryption me uh, methods that they may be using, but we know what they're doing. We know potentially what those breakpoints are. Uh, it gives us target areas to look at. Uh, also, from a 
of the replay standpoint, you know, can these replay attacks be generated externally? If we look at a device and we can figure out this attack method um, from an internal standpoint, can that be strapulated out and carried out externally against the device if we know certain things uh, about that device or those type of devices communications? Uh, we want to be able to validate that whole end-to-end -end security, the data flow, the security, and really get our mind around those concepts. And this plays a big part in ongoing security testing uh, and testing methodologies. Uh, we want to get into injection attacks and fuzzing. Uh, we used fuzzing uh, uh, in this particular example to figure out or start figuring out how that key structure is laid out. Or, or we actually identified that a portion of that was the actual MAC address um, by looking at the data that was echoed back on this particular device uh, and its encoding, we were able to fuzz that out. What about the key? Uh, we haven't done the fuzzing on that, but what if we did? What would be the impact of that? Is there things that we could do to cause adverse reaction in the system. Is there a master key? Is there something I could fuzz into this device that it would go, hey, and give up the ghost and roll the lock? Uh, we don't know. These are some kind of fuzzing injection tax. We want to be able to open up um, to these environments for further testing. Uh, we have the ability to do this in both directions, cloud and target. As an example, we've seen the data came in, coming back from the uh, BLE device to the bridge um, to the microcontroller, what's that data used for? Often that data coming back from the device is status data. So that status data can change what's happening on your mobile application. And I actually tested that. Uh, we did, I did some um, replay of communication and altered it and was able to make um, the mobile application changed status, saying the lock was open when it was closed, or saying it was closed when it was open by injecting uh, at this particular level. Now, how does that how does that impact someone else's lock? It doesn't. It just gives us an idea of how the communication works and opens up further ideas and concepts around testing, injection, replay, and actually fuzzing based attacks. Uh, we want to check for fault conditions. Can we, and I've done some of these, can I send keys of all zeros or all Fs and cause a reset or a crash? Uh, in the cases that I did here, uh, no, um, that did not work. But that doesn't mean there isn't something that would have adverse effect on how the device uh, functions. Um, and some of this stuff plays in big further as I talk about some of the other concepts around what we want to do. Uh, and one of the things is uh, weaponizing the bridge technology. If I can take, if I can go out and buy a device, a Bluetooth low energy device that has a bridge, I can tap into the inter interchip communication on that bridge, map all of the end-to-end -end security from the cloud to the device out, figuring out how it works, can then from inside my device, reprogram it to turn it into a weapon to attack someone else's device. That's what potentially interests me. Once you figure out how the device works, can I weaponize it? What does that mean if we actually do that? Um, so th we got a future here. What is that future? What do we got planned next? Uh, I had some of this stuff. I talked about this uh, last year. Uh, some of the things got delayed a little bit, but we're, we're starting to move forward on some of those. Uh, I'm working on a white paper. I actually got one page of it put together. The goal is to have it done by Q3, and it's to cover these concepts, methodologies uh, around this. Uh, we're also working on a tool, uh, kind of a UART proxy, uh, I hopefully will have something available by Q3, Q4 this year. Um, and the goal of the tool is we can take a device, we can tap into it, cut the runs, route the data off of it into this tool and be able to do man in the middle, fuzzing, replay type communication uh, testing on the internal circuits uh, of an actual board within its functioning uh, IoT ecosystem uh, actual environment. 
uh, we do have uh, some basic tools that I started writing up and, and I like hardly horribly suck as a programmer and very slow. Uh, I actually have two other guys from Rapid7 uh, that are helping me out with this and they're looking at some other stuff. Um, right now we're um, doing some stuff in Python. The ultimate goal is this initial release will probably have some kind of tool that will be more of a command line, uh, similar to the stuff that I've personally written and put together, uh, but with more features and functions. Uh, and then the ultimate goal will be to be able to have a, a graphic user interface of some type uh, to be able to see the data, analyze the data, and carry out a various type of testing like fuzzing, man in the middle, and replay style attacks. So um, I think we're at 40 minutes on this, and I think that pretty much finishes up what I have. Uh, again, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, we're covering, uh, in this case here, we covered, you know, uh, reverse engineering the boards, tapping in the boards, utilizing um, uh, design breakout boards, looking at the data, using what's available to analyze that data and decode it, and then working around uh, fuzzing and replay to try to figure out how the end-to-end -end security of the technology works. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this. I'm going to be uh, jumping over into the other channel uh, since we're done here. And uh, if you have any questions, kind of meet me over there and uh, hopefully I can answer those for you. We think about IoT Village as a movement. These devices are being adopted so rapidly that security is not effectively being baked into the development and deployment of those solutions. That puts consumers at risk, that puts businesses at risk, that puts governments at risk. And what we're trying to do is to galvanize a community around solving that problem. Every time somebody hears IOT, they immediately think, I don't want this in my house. But as time goes by, that choice of having something in your house or not is not really there. You can walk in the village, you won't feel like you're asking a dumb question, and you'll still walk away learning something no matter what your skill level is or knowledge. IoT Village provides an opportunity for people to experience security in a very tangible, very real way. So what ends up happening is, I can kill Lisa right now. She's being <laughs> smothered. She's flatlining, patient monitor's going nuts, she's dead. What's going on at the nurse's station? She's fine. What I'm doing right now is we are replaying recorded data of a healthy patient. So this patient monitor is something you'd see in every hospital room in America probably. The IoT Village seeks to raise awareness of IoT security. We want consumers to be able to make informed decisions and we want manufacturers to improve their security. So we put a lot of work into the security on the Bird 2 and we wanted to put it in front of the DEF CON community and see what people were able to do with it. We've learned stuff about our tech that we didn't previously know and from my perspective that's phenomenal because we have a really talented team internally but when we can be educated by people external to the company it's a big, big win. We really want to show that uh, we very much welcome the work that uh, security researchers do. And uh, even though we work in a world, the medical device world, that's not as accessible to uh, the people that work in this space, we really value the input that uh, researchers have. We want to show that we, uh, we love for them to work with us on, uh, on medical devices and uh, what they can find in it. Security is a mission critical part of being a pioneer. And by participating in this, they're able to address some of the challenges that are introduced through innovation. Building a contest to challenge hackers, you know, at the world's biggest hacker conference, if these guys didn't know what they were doing, this room would be empty. So IoT Village is awesome. Unfortunately, like a lot of hackers work in these uh, small groups. They don't really share a lot of information because they kind of want to monetize or capitalize off of the information that they have. So being here in IoT Village gives us an opportunity to talk to a bunch of other hackers that we wouldn't normally talk to and share information and kind of like come together as one. I think it is the best thing since sliced bread, personally. 
This year we're here at DEF CON helping run a uh, hands-on lab, IoT Hacking 101. How do we get people involved with this? Because it might be intimidating, right? Walking up into a big CTF at a big conference. The idea is that we handhold them all the way through from the basics of firmware analysis right through to discovering a bug and popping a device or two. I just connected over NetCat. There was nothing fancy, no authentication, anything like that. And this number here is your authentication token. It's a serial number on the device. That's what they're using for authentication. So what we're doing is that we're showing people how we find vulnerabilities in embedded devices. Specifically, I've been targeting NAS devices, and I've been showing how we find vulnerabilities, develop an exploit for it, and exploit it from the attacker's perspective. IoT Village is the face of IoT security worldwide. They're probably the most preeminent brand when it comes to dealing with IoT security. We have expertise, they have expertise, and we feel that it's more than just a sponsorship, it's more of a partnership in which we share stuff with each other. The visibility that you get from all of these conferences is, a, is an amazing thing. It's only going to get more and more relevant, and the devices are only going to get more and more prevalent. And so I think it's just a great interactive, hands-on experience for people to come and get immersed. We know that these security challenges that are inherent within connected devices, they're not going away on their own. We're able to make these challenges come alive, to become real, to be tangible. And when we do that, we enable people to participate in being part of the solution.